Okay, so good afternoon, and uh, today I want to talk about a deep wire, which is a package that I've been working on uh, to make it easier to do data manipulation. And I, I kind of wanted to frame this uh, talk about like why should you use deep wire, or why did I write deep wire, and what are the kind of the interesting things. And, and one of the things that uh, drove the development of deep wire is kind of thinking about what are the bottlenecks in the data analysis. And I think there really are kind of two main categories of bottleneck. First of all, you have this kind of cognitive side. You've got to think about what you want to do. Once you've thought about it, you need to describe it precisely. In other words, you have to program that. You have to tell the computer what to do. And then finally, the computer has to go away and do it. So we've sort of got this cognitive bottleneck, and we've got this computational. Now, I mean, most of the time, I'm most interested in this sort of cognitive bottleneck because I think, by and large, for most problems, you spend more time thinking about it than you do computing. But as the size of your data gets bigger, the computational size, the, the computational time gets bigger too, and that can become a problem. So, when talking about deep I want to talk first about this, like the thinking side. Then we'll talk about the describing side, and then finally the doing side. So the, the way that dplyr makes it easier to think about data manipulation is by kind of telling you, in my humble opinion, what you want to do when you are manipulating data sets. So my kind of my claim is that if you use these five verbs, this allows you to solve the vast majority of data analysis challenges. So the five verbs are filtering when you're selecting rows based on criteria, uh, selecting when you're pulling out a subset of the columns to look at, uh, arrange when you change the order of the rows, mutate when you add new columns which are functions of existing columns, and finally summarize. And my kind of claim, to which I have no, uh, absolutely no supporting data, but I think if you <laughs> combine these five verbs with a group by operator, then this allows you to solve a very large set of data analysis challenges. Now, of course, when you're doing a data analysis, you're typically not just working with a single data frame, you're often working with multiple data frames. So to go along with these verbs that work on a table at a time, we also have uh, verbs that allow you to combine multiple tables. These basically are the joins of SQL. If you've ever worked with SQL at all, you've probably heard of left joins and inner joins. Uh, two other joins, and these are, these are basically implemented by the merge function in base R. Two other types of joins that I've recently learned about, I think are particularly interesting, are the semi-join and the anti-join. So the, the inner join and the left join are going to add new columns. The semi-join and the anti-join don't change the columns. They select either for the semi-join or the rows and the X that match Y, or the rows and the X that don't match. These are really, really useful when you're matching together data sets and you want to find out which rows don't match, which days don't I have where the data sets. Now, in the development of dplyr and in, in really the sort of the, the development of all the packages I'm working on currently, there have been three things that have really profoundly impacted the way that I build tools for data analysis. So the first one of these is the uh, pipe operator. How many of you have seen this already in some Okay. The second is uh, writing this advanced R programming book, and then the third is RCDP. So I want to talk a little bit about how these have really profoundly impacted the design of our uh, DeepMind. So the first one is this percent greater than percent operator, this pipeline that comes from the Migrator package, although uh, it turns out that sort of somehow at this moment in time, many, many people have been thinking about pipelines, and there are another number of other packages that rather similar operators. So the goal of this pipeline operator is to make it easy to get out of your head what you're thinking, what you want to do, and turning it into a precise, precise description, a program that the computer can understand. And the, the, the pipe operator basically allows you to write code like this. So before I kind of describe what it does, it's the, the easiest way to read this is to read it as there. So we start with the flights data, then we filter it to remove all the missing the rows which have a missing value of departure delay, then we group it by date and hour, then we summarize it to compute the average delay and the number of observations in each group, then we uh, filter it to remove all of the groups that are too small and we expect that the variation in the mean might be too Now if we don't have the Piper operator, we have to write the function something like this. 
So Dplyr uses a, uh, a very functional interface of every function, uh, nothing kind of modifies in place, everything takes a data frame as input and returns a data frame as output. So without the pipe already, you have to write code like this. So you can read this, but you've got to kind of read it inside out, flights, filter, group by summarize filter, and then for these outermost things, the, the important arguments are rather far away. So what this pipe operator does is it basically takes the left-hand side and inserts it into the argument on the, the first argument on the right-hand side. So it's doing this with a lexical transformation. This is kind of, there's a number of things that this is kind of similar to it, like uh, method chaining in JavaScript, or if you've ever used Haskell, this is like the arrow notation for monads. But the idea is to take something that's very functional, but if you have a functional interface, you have to kind of read it from inside out, which is awkward, and allows you to basically write as a series of imperative statements, do this, do that, do something else. Whereas behind the scenes, uh, the deep line might be doing something much more complicated. It's cool, well, one thing that's neat about this is that any, uh, any function can take advantage of this piping syntax. All it needs to do is have the same type of the first argument as it does of the thing that it returns. And there's sort of a working on a sequence of updates to my packages, so tidyr, which is kind of an update to reshape2, which makes it easy to tidy data, dplyr, which I'm talking about now, and ggviz uh, for visualization. So all of these packages use the piping operator that designed around this uh, function composition interface, which makes it very, very easy to string together multiple operations to do a real data. The next thing that's had a profound impact on the way that I write tools is RCPP, and the main impact that that's had on DeepLyer is that when you're actually doing the computation, it's actually rather fast. So RCPP makes it very, very easy to write high-performance code in C++. I strongly encourage you, even if you think writing C++ code sounds like an absolute nightmare, it is not that hard to learn. I think you can learn the basics of what you need to be useful in maybe your week. Now, I've been helped with uh, Romain Francois has written a lot of the code in dplyr to make it really, really fast. And it's much, 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 much faster than plyr and uh, roughly competitive with uh, data table. But by and large, uh, dplyr will always kind of be a little slower than data table due to some fundamental uh, differences in opinion. But by and large, I think that the, the, the performance is comparable. So here's just a very simple example. We're taking a, a data frame about that is, we group it by players, and we compute the mean at bat score of a number of observations. We can do that with deep plier, plier, or data table. If you do some timings, well, plier took like 6,500 milliseconds, really, really slow. Base R is uh, a lot faster, 300 milliseconds. Uh, deep plier, about 40 milliseconds, and then data table, 20 milliseconds. So data table is like twice as fast, relatively, but it's uh, only 20 milliseconds. So the, the final thing um, that's had a really profound impact is writing this advanced R book because it forced me to understand aspects of R code that I've kind of like dabbled my toes in but never really deeply understood before. And one of those things is non-standard evaluation. So non-standard evaluation is one of the things that I think kind of profoundly makes R R. It makes R different to other programming languages because it's, its goal this is what makes R, I think, a really fantastic platform for doing data analysis, not just a great language. So non-standard evaluation is, is, is something that uh, functions like LM and subset and transform do. So when you type the name of a variable and a function interprets it in a different way to just retrieving the value of that uh, variable from the current environment, that's non-standard evaluation. And the, the main consequence of, of me getting a better understanding of non-standard evaluation is that it allows dplyr to also talk very easily to remote databases or remote tables stored in SQL databases. And so, for example, when you write a, a sequence of operations in uh, dplyr, the thing that you're transforming, this flight data set, that might not be a local data frame, that might in fact be a remote database table, and when you do that, dplyr will generate the SQL that you need to perform the equivalent query. Now, if you're familiar with uh, SQL, you'll look at a few things here, and it's you know probably not how you would write SQL, and maybe there's sort of an extra nested subquery here. 
So D5 isn't guaranteed to make like the most efficient SQL query in the world, but what it does allow you to do is think in R, and it will translate your code to SQL. And I think that, that, that when writing R code and writing SQL code is really challenging, not because R and SQL are so different, but because they're so similar, but there's a few like really frustrating things. So for example, uh, in SQL, or at least in, in this dialect of SQL, you really should quote all of your variable names, so SQL knows those are variable names, that allows you to use variable names that to SQL are special, like select from, <coughs> This is another important difference that, uh, you know, in, in R, a little one is a floating point number. Uh, in SQL, if you want a floating point one, you have to put a point zero after it. In R, if you want an integer one, of course, you put a capital L after it, because capital L obviously stands for uh, integer. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in SQL, you can just write a little one. So it does more complicated things, you know, when you start using, uh, uh, so there's other little things, right? Like in a string in R, you can use either single quotes or double quotes. In SQL, you must use single quotes. Double bar becomes four. Sing double equals becomes single equals, and so on. So you can imagine, even if you haven't written SQL code before, like writing some R code or writing some SQL code, it's going to be really, really frustrating because you keep forgetting all these little differences. So I have kind of a similar problem with uh, switching between R and C++. It's like, you know, am I supposed to put a semicolon at the end of this line or not? So Deepwire is available for CRAN now. From CRAN now, it is uh, much, much faster than Deepwire. I think it, it provides a really useful set of verbs that help constrain the problem when you're doing a data manipulation, rather than looking through the you know, tens of thousands of possible uh, functions and thousands of possible R functions. When you're tackling a data analysis problem, I believe that most of the time you could solve it with these verbs or some combination of those verbs. So it makes the problem, it constrains the problem, which makes it easy to think about it. The pipeline makes it easier to describe it computationally. And then we've done a lot of work behind the scenes to actually do it as efficiently as possible. So where's, go, where's Dplyer going next? Uh, the next version will have more remote data sources. So currently, uh, you can talk to MySQL and Postgres and SQLite and Google BigQuery and 1ADB, and there's some pull requests for Oracle and Impala and SQL Server and a few others. Um, I think I, I kind of said that the, the book has been really transformative to helping me understand how to do non-standard evaluation. Uh, I don't think Deepflyer does non-standard evaluation correctly currently, so the next version will also do that. And the other thing I think that's really important with non-standard evaluation is that every function that does non-standard evaluation has to provide an escape hatch that does regular evaluation. And that, that, that's because functions that do non-standard evaluation are great for working and interactively at the console. They're a little bit magical. They save you time. And if something goes wrong, you see it right away because you're interacting with the data. That's the opposite of what you want when you're programming. When you're programming, you want to be explicit. You want to spend a little bit more time up front to spell out exactly what you expect. Uh, and so in the future version of Dplyr, we'll have versions, two versions of every function, one that is suitable for interactive use and one that is suitable for programming. There's some other little things like making it easier to do self-join, and there's lots and lots of uh, bug fixes. and. Uh, I'm currently, unfortunately, doing too much traveling, but uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, uh, Deep Lyre Point 3 will be up on track. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Am I, am I right in thinking that you can create, you can use Deep Lyre on data table objects? And if so, is there any advantage to doing that? Or is it just that they work as if they were a data frame? So you can, uh, one of the other data sources that uh, Deepflyer supports is using data table objects directly. Uh, there is basically no advantage to that because unfortunately I've done, not done a terribly <laughs> good job of writing that source and so it tends to make data tables slower than both raw data tables or using raw data frames. It's not something that I currently recommend. Well, I've got another one then. Okay. Um, you, what about different varieties of SQL? 
we're talking to SQL Server or Postgres or Oracle, are there, are there any potential problems there? Uh, so the question was about different varieties of uh, SQL and there are basically, as far as I can tell, the rule is when you create a new database, you must develop a new way of quoting variables and uh, quoting strings. So I think every no database is terribly consistent. One of the things that's really frustrating about SQL is although that there is this ANSI SQL standard, that standard is closed. If you want to read it, it costs like $3,000 to buy. So there's a lot of variation in implementation, and DPLY kind of tries to paper over that as much as possible. Um, but it, 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 there's more detail available on the, in the, the DPLY vignettes, which uh, I should mention. If you want to find out more, you can just Google for it. The vignettes describe in a bit more detail how the database connection works and how the SQL transmission works. But yes, SQL variations are a huge, huge, huge pain. So the, the question is what uh, connection is used for remote databases. Currently I'm using like the individual database packages, so R PostgreSQL, R MySQL, R SQLite and so on. Uh, there's not currently any support for RODBC because it doesn't use the, the standard GBI database interface that every other database package does. So I guess I'll interpret your question broadly as how does dplyr kind of uh, fit in with plyr. Uh, plyr sort of solved a somewhat different set of problems. It was sort of thinking about if you have all these different types of data inputs like lists and data frames and arrays and different types of outputs, what do you do? Um, and and so, so dplyr really just implements a very, very small subset of plyr which is basically ddplyr, ldplyr, and dlplyr. Uh, my feeling is now, um, if, you, if you're using those bits of, of plier, you're better off switching to dplyr. And in fact, it's basically a cost-free translation because dplyr is so much faster than plier. Um, you know, basically, if you start a plier job running and it takes more than five minutes, you should just start learning dplyr <laughs> and then run that <laughs> instead of get on the plier job. Thank you.